Um, our next speaker is, is may be familiar with Johnny Gravio. If you haven't met him, you've probably heard him. He is one of the voices of the University of Newcastle. He's one of those archivists who's turned the science of archive into an incredibly living and vibrant force. <laughs> out to make this city, this town and this Hunter Valley live in our minds, in our hearts. So over to you, Johnny. Thank you very much. I'm glad this microphone's here because I was screaming at um, my son to clean his room, so I'm a bit hoarse. So I'm very sorry. He's at home in the naughty chair. Uh, the Xbox plug has been removed. And it's not getting back in, at least until I get back home, which will be a while. Okay, um, I'm, thank you very much. It's a great honour to, to be asked to come here tonight and um, do things I like doing which is like researching history. So uh, the topic of the talk is the origins of the King Edward Park Recreation Reserve, which I didn't know until a couple of days ago. So I'm going to share what I know and if you already know it, I'm very sorry. It starts with a mystery. Um, when all the Herald people were facing the sack, I digitised this 1966 um, thing. And in the middle of the thing, this newspaper supplement, there was this engraving. And it said King Edward Park, where many a feud was settled. So I quickly beamed it to Anne, because I know Anne is sort of keeping up to date with all the, all the uh, King Edward Park. And I just keep feeding these, these little bits of, of thing. But I didn't know what this meant. So I sort of uh, rigged this talk around trying to find out what this thing meant. This King Edward Park, where many a feud was settled. This is a newspaper clipping from um, 1897 when they had the centenary of the European discovery of Newcastle. And there's reference down here to a native duel in Newcastle that took place at the site of the obelisk. And what happened is if uh, the Aboriginal people had noses out of joint with one another's tribes, they'd send messages through the old ladies to the, you know, to say so-and-so's got his nose out of joint. They had to all come here right to, to the obelisk site, which was the windmill, and before then, just that hilly ground, and they'd fight it out. And they'd fight it out by, you know, it's just like a white jewel with guns, but not necessarily with guns, with, with no, no, not spears, um, nulla nullas, clubs. And it'd be just like, you know, the green man myth? You know, where you get whacked in the head and then they whack you in the head and so on and so on. That's what they would do until someone was bleed to death and the last man standing won or until the Aboriginal people said, enough is enough, it's solved, that's it. And that, that's how they solved their duels. So that was a black connection to that duel. And I thought, no, that's interesting. So I know about that because we digitised this a few years ago. That's November 1801, okay? Boralia and Grant and all those people who came up on the survey mission came up between June and July. Wickstead was in here, who was the first sort of corporal in charge in July. Um, they got everyone drunk and had a big rebellion and mutiny and they had all sorts of trouble. So this is very early in terms of wide settlement. This is a part of a panorama of Newcastle 1821 done by Edward Charles Close. We originally thought all these, all these paintings were by Sophia Campbell. But as you can see, there are Aboriginal people at the site of the obelisk, which forms part of this particular precinct. So there's that connection to Jules, Aboriginal people. Okay. Uh, here's a painting. I'm just trying to give you a bit of the, of the gist. This is the, the wharf, Black Wharf here, um, where our first coal exports went out. And they weren't just our first coal exports, they were the first coal exports of the country. So that's the birthplace of the economy on that little black wharf. Now, this is Watt Street, and to get your bearings, that's where the train station is now. It's basically sitting on water. Okay, and that little black wharf is where that little roundabout is. Okay, so we're talking about, we're going to centre along this line. We're just going to talk about Watt Street now, going up to that hill. That's the uh, government cottage, or the government... Um, the Commandant's residence. This is from Lyson, it's in the gallery. 
This is um, an overlay of the uh, Armstrong plan from 1830, and I've put it on Google Earth so you can see, you can maybe make it out, but that's the Black Wharf there. Uh, and it moves all along here, and you can see that that's, uh, that's Watt Street as it was. So it's the ghost landscape basically over the, the modern landscape. Now, our informant this evening is John Bingle. John Bingle's been dead for quite a long lot of years, but the good thing about historians is that we get to talk to these guys, and they tell us things, especially if you listen. So John Bingle's going to be basically who I'm just talking for him because he's not alive anymore. But basically, everything I'm going to tell you now comes from his mouth, because he's an eyewitness. Uh, John, do you know who John Bingle is? You don't? Well, you've got to know. He's one of the greatest heroes that Newcastle has ever created. But no one knows about him. Or do they? There's a street named after him. But look, he was a sailor merchant landholder. He first visited Newcastle in December 1821. He met Major Morissette, King Lash. And, um, but not to his descendants. Um, Bingle and Co. established the first regular training, uh, trading service between Sydney and Newcastle. He married in 18, 1824, went to Tasmania to marry, ended up moving to Scone, uh, where he became a magistrate. And he was having sort of um, trials in his living room. So he was a very, very enthusiastic man. Uh, 1837, he returned to England and then returned back to Australia in 1842, and he commenced his business in 1851. He was the first chair of the Chamber of Commerce in May 1856, and the first message ever sent by telegraph online from Sydney to Newcastle on the 11th of January 1860 was sent from his office. Boring historical facts, don't you think? No? When he did, the, one big mystery for me is they always say he built the bogey hole. You always know this? No? God, you don't know this. Look, I'm an Italian kid and I know this. My parents came here in the 1950s and I know more about this. Why? What's the matter with you Australians? Anyway, he got taught, taken around by Morissette. It only dawned on me one night ago that this makes him a witness, an eyewitness. He's a first-hand account. Now, Morissette was running this... Um, place very, very harshly, according to various contemporary eyewitnesses. You know, they were slashing and burning, and, you know, whipping people constantly for punishment. Now, he is being interrogated in 1821, or being questioned by the first consultant that ever came to Australia, Big. Nowhere in the Big report does he say, yes, I, um, I used a couple of convicts to go and dig myself out a bath so that I could have a nice little swim whenever I felt like it. That was not an, an appropriate use of funds. But when he visited here in December 1821, Morissette did take Bingle for a little walk. And this is what Bingle said. The Commandant's residence, named the Government House, was situated in the line of Watt Street, about 100 yards from the corner of the barrack wall in Church Street. This building was a convenient and pretty cottage. That's it there but was unfortunately destroyed by fire some time after Major Morissette left to join his regiment. At the back of it, over a hill, the Major had made a pretty walk called the Horseshoe, the only outlet even to the present day in the shape of a pleasant stroll. So he made the walk, that's what he's saying. And as the rocks washed by the sea, he had a bath excavated for his own use which remains in its primitive state, called Morissette's Bath. And this is the earliest drawing that we've got of it, from Conrad Martins, and it was done on the 13th of May, 1841. It's a misuse of government funds. But, like all wonderful human beings, you get them together with a couple of mates, and they tell you everything. They tell you what's really going on because the historical records are only part of the story. Human beings do other things besides make records. And usually it's the other part of the things that you've got to know. Now this guy was with him and he blabbed in 1873 in his book, The Past and Pleasant Records of Australia. He told the whole story. So he's the primary source, very trustworthy. 
Now, who's behind all this? Soon after the formation of the exchange, and when in working order, this is what people do is because Newcastle's not being governed by anybody, they are trying to lobby Sydney, all governance is from Sydney. Right? So they're trying to get control. They're trying to get some sort of local control here. Look, by the end of this, you're going to realise nothing changes. <laughs> Just thought I'd tell you that. And so they form a Chamber of Commerce in May of 1856. All right? And what they do is that they... Um, the first thing they do is this. They applied to the government to allot then a piece of land for the erection of a suitable building which was given at the same time as the post office was erected and the adjoining allotment to it was given the site of an exchange. So they wanted these two sites here down in Watt Street to run themselves an exchange at a meeting place, like an early public library. A Chamber of Commerce was established in May 1856. The government were induced by the Chamber to grant the citizens in perpetuity 35 acres of land as a recreation ground in the most delightful and picturesque part of Newcastle from the top of Watt Street, round the horseshoe, to the obelisk. The reason why you've got this land is because of the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Are any business people here today? They should be. They should be. This is the business people doing this. Right? Besides wanting offices so that they could start having a place for captains to start doing deals, right? To start organising the harbour better. They wanted that, but they also did this. And this is the area you're talking about. This is the horseshoe. What do you know about horseshoes? They're lucky. They're lucky. This is all area for public reserve. All here, this is where we're talking. This is the obelisk up here. This is Watt Street here, okay? Who's the chair of the Chamber of Commerce? Yes, the Bingle. <laughs> Who got taken around in 1821? Mr. Bingle. What's he done? He's gone and grabbed this wonderful pleasure palace that Morissette had for his own enjoyment. And the first thing he does as chair of the first business chamber of Newcastle is to give it to the people. Is he a hero or what? Yes. A round of applause. Now, um, this is a scene taken from Shepherd's Hill, and here's another argument with the connection. There's an argument that he built that, that path. There's another argument that maybe it was already there. Now, I'm sure our next guests will be able to fill in on the Aboriginal paths, but our roads basically follow the Aboriginal paths. So, because they know how to get everywhere. They had thousands of years to work out the best routes. So this is a painting, an engraving from a painting um, showing Aboriginal people. There's another one there. And this is the path from the top of Shepherd's Hill. So I would think that it was just a, a path he took over that was already there. We have a possible name for it as well. We're not sure of this, but it occurs in two documents that we know of. One is um, H.T. Plews's plan from 1858. And South Shepherd's Hill is called Canterin. We're not quite sure if it's an Aboriginal word, but that's what's been recorded there. It's also mentioned in the news um, account of something, someone doing something at Canterin. So there's that connection. And that's another um, drawing from Conrad Martins taken from the same location where he identifies uh, the Shepherd's Hill. John Bingle to Newcastle now. These are words of wisdom from his dead cold hand. The reminiscences of old times are most refreshing, for there once was an amount of genial and kindly feeling existing at that time, which does not, I regret to say, influence our citizens now to work the one with the other. It is truly grievous the want of... It's the Italian kid. Ill feeling and bickerings displayed at our public meetings. <laughs> Even when we are personally concerned. But call a public meeting for any local display or especially for a patriotic purpose, then I am proud of my fellow townsmen who can, when the matter is properly brought before them, throw off all bickerings and strife and join heart and hand and purse for the advancement of either object. 
At times like these, the good qualities of our townspeople are brought out without a dissenting voice. This is 1873. <laughs> Now it's, yeah. yeah, well look, when you can start going and getting dead guys out, that's probably best. But look, the wonderful thing about this is that that's what starts happening later. Around the wars, you start finding the Wattle Day League start to tra tra plant trees up in this area, and it did become that thoroughfare for all the various commemorative um, areas. So that patriotic area, this became. But that's another person's job, to find that out. John Bingle to the Newcastle business community. After the fire, the subscribers were disheartened. However, it is never too late to mend. So it is to be hoped that our influential commercial men may throw all jealousies aside and bestir themselves in carrying out the views and intentions of their former benefactors. Okay? We've forgotten what we did. John Dingle to future Newcastle. I venture to prophecy that Newcastle will take the lead in all the colonies, and if the consumption and demand increased, if, sorry, if the consumption and increased demand for coal to the eastward of Cape of Good Hope continues as at present, Newcastle must become one of the greatest cities in the southern hemisphere in wealth and prosperity. Now we are the greatest coal port on earth. Are we wealthy and prosperous? What has happened? We've been stuffed. <laughs> it requires us as citizens to bury all paltry jealousies and unite for the advancement of our city and as its progress is developed, our interests, which are identical, will also go onward. And the years in store for us will cause greater moral and commercial successes to be achieved than have been chronicled in either the past or present records of Newcastle. Slide here. Guess where that is? Yeah. Um, I just found this in the John Turner next, but I just want to see that little thing there. That's that little memorial that recently got got wrecked, is it? No. There's no trees around here, but they're all little. They're all getting planted. Thank you. Italian background can be traced back to the Roman orator Cicero. Uh, <laughs> he's, only just, he's only just warming up. <laughs> Mr. Bingle has been replaced by Mr. Bungle. Uh, Who? Mr. Bungle. And I thought the idea of the, uh, a place where feuds are settled was lovely, and the idea of giving a nulla nulla to each member of the company bodies. Those comments would be a good idea if they slowly knock one another out. <laughs> Bring back Mr. Bingle. So thank you, John. That was great. Wonderful. Wonderful.